All right, guys, so greetings and welcome. My name is Willa Soroka, and I am the Education Specialist here at New Hampshire Audubon. I'm thrilled that you could join us for our fourth, pretty sure it's the fourth webinar series in our pollinator series that started this particular year. But before we begin, I would like to do a brief acknowledgement. This presentation is streaming to you from our headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, which is located within the site of the ancient village of Penacook in Endakina, which is the traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. I would like to acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and our ancestors, the Al Nambak, who have stewarded Endakina throughout the generations for thousands of years. New Hampshire Audubon is honored to continue the stewardship of these lands providing opportunities for all people to form connections to the natural world through our programs and wildlife sanctuaries around the state. I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy by visiting the website native-land.ca. Here you can explore and click on territories of indigenous people and get connected to resources to learn more. And for a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, check out all the educational resources located at indigenousnh.com. Some brief Zoom information before we dive in. We do have about 40 people registered for this evening's talk. So you'll see that we are in full webinar mode. That means all attendees' cameras have been set to off and your audio set to mute. That said, feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, comments, and reactions you might have and reserve the Q&A button for any questions that you would like answered by tonight's panelists. For those of you who joined us for the last pollinator webinar, welcome back. Your enthusiasm for our organization, and more specifically tonight's topic, is so appreciated. For those of you attending for the first time this evening, we are so grateful for your presence. Many thanks go out to the Benjamin and Gertrude Couch Foundation for their generous grant, which enables us to bring these amazing speakers to our webinars where we can share in their enthusiasm and learn from their experience without having to leave the comfort of our own homes. Before we jump into tonight's presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to describe how this particular webinar fits into the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. For those of you who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental organization that is completely independent from national Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission which has four programmatic pillars, conserving around 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for both habit as, habitat as well as recreation, researching trends and discovering solutions for species in peril, connecting people to nature through environmental education via school programs, field trips, summer camp, webinars like these, and advocating for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature to protect the natural environment for wildlife and for people. If anyone in attendance tonight is a volunteer, a member, or supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. We simply could not achieve our charitable mission without you. And if you'd like to become a part of our conservation family, please check out our website for additional ways to get involved. I'd like to pass the mic on to our senior biologist, Diane DeLuca, who has been an integral part in the development of not only this pollinator series, but in the incredible pollinator demonstration garden located at our state headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire. If you haven't yet checked it out, I highly encourage you to take the trip. Diane, whenever you're ready, feel free to take it over. Thanks, Willa. And I'd just like to give a shout out to Willa for being the co-host on all of these pollinator webinars. She does such a wonderful job and as you can see, I'm not on video because of my internet connection. So um, really depend on Willa and I so appreciate her being here. So tonight we're very lucky to have Heidi Holman. And I'd like to just thank Heidi for taking time out of her very busy field season to share her work with about New Hampshire's butterflies. We're very appreciative um, to benefit from her expertise in tonight's webinar. So Heidi is a wildlife diversity biologist with New Hampshire Fish and Games non-game and endangered program, wildlife program. She grew up in Southwest New Hampshire and was fortunate enough to return to the state 
after receiving her master's degree from the University of Minnesota in conservation biology. Um, her primary responsibilities at New Hampshire Fish and Game have been implementation of recovery efforts for the Carnot Blue Butterfly and the New England Cottontail Rabbit with habitat restoration and release of individuals from captive breeding programs um, in both of those species. Um, her current focus is using the knowledge gained from the recovery effort for Carnot Blue Butterflies con to conserve other Lepidoptera in the state. So tonight, Heidi is going to explore some of the butterflies of New Hampshire and discuss actions we can all take to preserve their diversity in our state. And she'll share a new initiative that she is leading to better understand our New Hampshire butterfly populations, the New Hampshire Butterfly Monitoring Network, um, which I am very excited about. And this is an opportunity for all of us to get involved in collecting data that will allow biologists to monitor these populations over time. So thanks, Heidi, for all you've done for wildlife in the state of New Hampshire and for sharing some of your important work tonight. We're very appreciative. Thanks, Diane. Um, I'm always happy to come talk about butterflies. And as you mentioned, um, this is a new initiative that we are happy to be sharing. So let's get going. So as Diane said, the Butterfly Monitoring Network. We're trying to promote an opportunity for us to all work together because we know that in cases like the corner blue butterfly, some extreme circumstances have brought them to the brink of extinction, warranting protection from the Federal Endangered Species Act. And we're trying to move the needle to prevent getting to those extreme situations. And so, one of the things we need to do to keep common species common is we need baseline information. Where do they live? How many of them are there? And what are they doing in our state? So from what we know of the data that does exist, and one of the most comprehensive um, documents put together was by New Hampshire Audubon, uh, about 2013, they compiled the data sets of everyone that they knew who had been collecting information on butterflies. And to be honest, it only was about 15, 16 different people and organizations, you know, people like Fish and Game who had been tracking them while we were doing Carner Blue work or the New Hampshire National Guard, or there were a few um, people themselves who had great data sets and, and they shared them. And so what we found out from that work in museum records and, and records at UNH, 130 some odd species were said to have been in the state. But as we continue to look at that and account for potentially a misidentification or a hurricane that might have swept something in here, we think that there's probably just over 100 species on any given basis. So butterflies have many threats, just like all wildlife. And so why we are concerned about them, general loss of habitat due to development. I mean, people need places to live too. And, and so we need to be smart about where we do that. They tend to be more sensitive to some of the chemicals that we use because we're targeting the plants that they might use or actually um, targeting them unfortunately, or maybe not them, but some other insect and, and they get the brunt as well. So um, climate change has so many potential impacts because they're temperature dependent. Disease has long been an issue. Invasive plants may take over their habitat. We know that they're moving north with climate change and people moving them around and um, just general gardening and before we really knew about the importance of native plants. And then of course impacts from recreation and agriculture. So that's a lot of different things that we need to be watching out for. 
What's really cool about butterflies is, you know, not only are we interested in them for themselves and their beauty and, and wanting to understand the different species and protecting biodiversity, because there's so many of them that live everywhere in our state and in small to large patches, they give us an opportunity to really look at the health of our state if we do this right. And you know, short life cycles, as it mentions here, makes them incredibly responsive. They're one, two years, sometimes even less than a year that they go through a life cycle versus a turtle, which may even take 12 years before it reproduces. So its life cycle is 20 to 60 years. So they're very um, reactive to a lot of these threats and they, they help us learn theories uh, very quickly. What I love about doing butterfly work and, and what we can do together is the fact that everyone can participate because they live across the state, because they fly during the day and they like nice weather and they tend to nectar and perch in places that are at eye level or even lower. We have the opportunity to actually see them. We actually can start to get good information on their species ID. And you don't have to go into a remote setting. You can be even in your yard. And it's just so wonderful that we can do this um, very readily. Citizen science, its ultimate goal is to actually feed into science. And of course, you know we want to be able to communicate that back. And, so here's some examples of how this type of data with these monitoring networks has been used in the past. There's the ability to track the shift in different butterfly communities relative to development or other landscape scale alterations. With climate change, there's so many questions about phenology and um, if there's going to be a mismatch between organisms with their food or with um, general climate conditions they need. And what was really interesting is the study that's referenced on the far right of the screen is talking about a surprise that came out of citizen science data. And it actually showed that some species shifted later into the season instead of earlier. So we would have thought being an insect and being temperature dependent and with warmer springs, they would come out earlier and, and it might be before their host plant is present, but uh, they actually found in some situations that that's not the, the straight response. So very fascinating work. And then um, as we go into our talk and we learn more about butterflies and, or maybe you already know, that there can be a number of generations that are expected in any year. And with warming temperatures, we may find that they have more um, life cycles in each season. And these are things that we're likely not gonna be able to detect for over a hundred species, but with your help, it's likely we'll detect it much sooner. Backing up. So to completely understand as we move forward and, and through this discussion, um, Butterfly 101, every single species follows the same life cycle. It's an egg that hatches into a caterpillar, alternative word is larva. They develop through several instars. It could be four, it could be five, hard to say, um, each species is different. And then um, they form a pupa, which people often think of as a cocoon or a chrysalis, um, different words, slightly different meanings, but the pupal stage. And then they become an adult butterfly, which is what we tend to really associate with. But again, they, they have all these other aspects of their life cycle. Every species is different and they do this in all different ways. And usually things that affect what their particular life history is, is what kind of plants do they eat as a caterpillar specifically? Do they eat one plant? 
Do they eat many plants? Is that plant available all year long or is it only available for a short window? And then it senesces. So that can really impact their life history. How many times do they do this in one growing season? So how many times are there adult butterflies flying? And what is their strategy to overwinter? Is it as an egg or the adult? And that really affects where they can live and also when we see them. And we'll talk about that. And in a few really rare cases, butterflies may migrate. And this looks different in some species. It's a moderate shift over time. It's not like a bird who migrates. I go south in the winter and I come back in the north uh, in, the, in the summer. Um, the monarch really is like the poster child of that type of migration for butterflies. So when we talk about generations, another word for that is broods. So you can think of uh, a hen sits on, she broods on her eggs. So there's one adult generation that lays eggs in any given year. So here's some examples. The frosted elfin has one brood or one generation and the adults fly in May and June and that's it. That's the only time we'll see them. Um, the rest of the time, they're either a chrysalis, an egg, or a caterpillar. In their case, um, by late June, they're a chrysalis, and they stay that way all the way until April or May the following year. The White Mountain Fritillary also only has one generation, and so we see the adults between July and September. What's interesting about that is that's a really long window for one generation. And it's not necessarily that there's more individuals so that there's a longer time they're eclosing and individuals are living. They actually seem to live longer as adults, which is so shocking because they're in the Alpine zone and the worst weather of the world, but they have adapted to be very conservative with themselves and their movements as adults. And so, um, their life, his, their lifetime in that adult phase is likely very much longer. Um, and then we have something like the eastern tail blue, which just continually goes through those life cycles. And there's no set wave of them. Like some of the other butterflies that have two generations or three generations, they're still in clusters and, and waves together. Whereas the eastern tail blue just they just seem to be all over the place and they're all doing their own thing and you can see them pretty much throughout the entire year. So butterflies have a very um, specific relationship again with habitat and, and that's because of their host plants. Well, depends on the butterfly. Some of them are great generalists, so they may eat beech and birch and cherry. And that's our Eastern tiger swallowtail, the Canadian tiger swallowtail. And we see them everywhere because those trees exist everywhere. So their habitat is everywhere. It's woods, it's woodland edges, it's wherever their host plant is. So they're pretty well spread. But then we have instances like the monarch butterfly and milkweed. So yeah, milkweed is pretty opportunistic and it'll grow anywhere, but the plant still has to be there. That, and here in New Hampshire, we really only have one common milkweed, the common milkweed. Um, other states, there may be four or five species of milkweed. Um, and then you get into your more specialist species, the ones that tend to be rare, like the frosted elfin and the corner blue. And they eat only wild lupin. And wild lupin only exists in pine barrens, which is a rare forest type that exists in our state. So that really restricts their habitat and where we would find them. And the same thing with the uh, white mountain fritillary who lives in the alpine zone and it's restricted to areas that are very wet up there that have some of their host plants like a violet and wetland specialist blueberries and willows. Okay. 
So butterflies can be put into large groups and it's kind of helpful to think about those to start out and it's really based on their life history. It is going to be down to genetics, but we're just looking at it as their morphology and these are the swallowtails. They tend to be really big butterflies that we can cue in on. They're as large as a monarch. And I know this past weekend, I was talking to a lot of my neighbors and people I knew, and I was like, oh, I, I saw butterflies out in the field here. Or, I was watching butterflies today. And they said, oh yeah, I just started seeing butterflies. And I knew right away, they hadn't seen butterflies until the Eastern tiger swallowtail was flying. They just, they actually probably aren't aware that there are so many small butterflies that aren't so conspicuous, but our swallowtails are definitely very beautiful and there's many species. Well before the swallowtails started flying in the last week or so, we had numerous um, whites and sulfurs that were out and about. Uh, the cabbage white was actually introduced to um, North America a long time ago, but it's done well. And also we have sulfurs, the clouded and an orange sulfur, and they look pretty similar. You have to start to get familiar with them and, and maybe their habitat a bit to identify them. But they've been flying since late April, early May. And maybe when you saw that white butterfly, you thought it was a moth. It just looks so bland but they are some of our most common species that fly throughout the year and often feed on um, plants in our gardens. And then we have this big group of blue butterflies. So whenever we talk about the corner blue, I get a lot of people that are excited. They saw a blue butterfly and they live up in Sugar Hill. And well, there's a lot of lupin up there, but that's a planted lupin. That's not from New Hampshire. And so it's not the native area that corner blues live, but they do have other blues. And many times it's the Eastern tailed blue, as we mentioned, they're pretty much visible all summer long. So um, it's a good chance you'll cue in on one. Uh, we also have coppers and silvery blues and hair streaks. And this is the satyrs group. Um, I thought it was satyr, but I guess it's, it's satyrs is the actual pronunciation. Uh, but they're brown butterflies with big eyes. And what's really cool is, you know, you can think of them as like um, the Greek and Roman gods, the half man, half horse or goat. Um, that's what they're sort of named after, I think, because they're woodland edge butterflies in many cases, and they have these eyes that's meant to um, deter birds from feeding on them, um, to make them less visible. And at the bottom here, you'll see this unique sort of genuses and clusters that belong in the same family um, includes the White Mountain Arctic, which is an alpine Arctic type species that's endemic to the state of New Hampshire and, and lives on top of Mount Washington. And then we have our fritillaries, which are orange and black. Uh, they similar to monarchs, but they have a, a very different um, unique look and, and they're visible in so many different locations. Most of them eat violets, but there are a few exceptions. There's large ones that are the size of monarchs, small ones that may um, be in meadows and wet areas. And then of course, the white mountain fritillary, which is also an endemic species that lives in top of the presidential range. And the last really large family is the skippers. And they're divided up into spread wing skippers that are a lot of dusky wings and cloudy wing. Um, they tend to land with their wings open, hence their name. And then our folded wing skippers, which I think a lot of people miss. They look like flies or maybe even crickets if you're just not thinking about it or a moth there and they land with their wings closed so they're not as conspicuous but between these two there's 30 to 40 species in our state so they make up a big group
So it's so amazing that people have been fascinated with butterflies forever. It just seems like in Europe, then it was just this very Victorian era thing to collect butterflies and make weird art with them. And the original people that were coming here did a lot of monitoring. Um, we think of Samuel Scudder, a Harvard entomologist, part of the AMC, who described a very large number of butterflies um, in our region and throughout the country. Uh, but we haven't had any sort of standardized monitoring like they do for birds um, until the 90s. And in 1994, there was um, the NABA butterfly counts. Um, there's different types of walks that were done in other areas that were standardized, like I said, in Europe that people are using. And so all the states are getting together and trying to um, talk about what they can do individually and how we can link our data across state lines because ultimately a lot of these species are, are present in a region or um, even multiple countries. So again, looking at what was compiled back in 2013 when Audubon uh, put all those records together, um, we had less than 10 species in many towns. So it was somewhat data poor. I mean, it was a great snapshot. It gave us a good idea of species um, historically to now, but it really was missing areas. Um, those locations with really high numbers tended to have a particular enthusiast or conservation group or university down in Durham that had people who were able to collect this information. So our goal has been to help train people. Let's, let's get more people out there. Let's improve that data set. Let's work together. And so we've been putting together these butterfly clubs and developing modules and training guides and getting opportunities for people to gather and begin discussing the fascinating lives of butterflies. And so, for example, um, the Super Sanctuary Butterfly Club down at the Harris Center of Education met, and they chose to use a reference guide, like the Kaufman's Guide, as they walk through some of these trainings with a group. During these trainings, we offer first just the basic biology and ways to describe and identify butterflies. Most simply, the hind wing and the fore wing. You need to learn the top or bottom wing, but these are the official terms. Then there's the ventral view or the dorsal view. And so when you think about that, the ventral view is when their wings are closed and the dorsal view when they're open. And when they're open, you're seeing the back of the butterfly. So that's how you can write that. Just takes a little while to use those terms regularly. And then we also start talking about things like the outer margin of the hind wing. It has orange dots, whoa. Okay, now I know what you're describing to me. Again, there's so many different words and descriptions that are out there. And through the course of these modules, you'll get better and better at being able to cue into those particular traits to help you identify a species uh, when you see it almost immediately in your yard. So I thought it would be good to go through a few species that are flying right now. Things that are being seen this week. And if you are inspired, maybe you can go out this weekend. It looks like it's gonna be nice and sunny. Uh, so one of the species that has been out in great numbers is called the crescent. And I say crescent species here because in the the northern part of the state, it may be a northern crescent, but for the rest of the state, it's a pearl crescent. So crescent is fine. Um, it's again, an orange and black butterfly, but it doesn't eat violet. It's not part of that fritillary family. And you can see when its wings are closed, it's, it's got a different color. Um, it actually eats asters. And 
I don't think it's specific to any aster. Um, I'm sure it prefers a lot of our native asters that you find in fields along roadside edges. Uh, and it overwinters as a late stage caterpillar. So likely um, some of our first butterflies that we saw back in April overwintered as an adult. So as soon as it got warm, the morning cloak came flying out. Uh, but this species had to finish developing into the chrysalis and then emerge as an adult. So that's why it's out a little bit later. Uh, very interesting. That's the crescent that you're looking um, to use as an identifier as well. So that's very helpful. But you can see between these two species, these two pictures here, I have what is apparently, I think, a male and a female. And so they can have a slightly different look, which is helpful uh, in the future if you're actually looking to, to monitor more in-depth information on a species. And not all species have key defining characteristics of males and females. Another species that's pretty common right now, and, and you will see it at other times throughout the summer, they have a couple broods, uh, is the American copper. So this is a blue looking butterfly, uh, but it has a very distinct large patch of orange on its um, forewing. So again, that upper wing, the forewing. So this species eats a lot of what sort of weedy plants, the rumix family, sheep sorrel and curly dock, things that'll come in as early pioneers after ground disturbance. And so it has a large variety of things it'll eat. And so that's what makes it somewhat common. Again, the tiger swallowtail. Um, and primarily in New Hampshire, since they've done a lot of taxonomic work and DNA, they've determined that we really have probably more Canadian tiger swallowtails that eat birch and beech and cherry versus the Eastern tiger swallowtail that lives south of us eats tulip trees quite often, which we don't really have. So again, here's a little bit more detailed information about that. If you were uh, unaware about Canadian versus Eastern, um, but one way you could look if you were curious if Easterns were moving up or was what you were seeing is you're looking at this yellow band when the wings are closed on the forewing. Common ringlets are flying right now. Uh, they are very closely related to um, the satyrs and the arctic, um, those brown, that brown family of butterflies. And often you're not going to notice this distinct coloring pattern when they're flying, I find. So it's not until they land that you can really appreciate their color sometimes. Um, they're in a lot of fields in open habitats because they eat grasses and rushes. So they have a lot of food available. They're not as particular about species, but they're looking for um, host plants in these groups. Again, the cabbage white, very common, um, very early, especially if you have a vegetable garden, this may be what's feeding on your kale or um, your broccoli. Eastern tail blues, again, new, the smallest butterfly in New Hampshire, contiguous uh, populations. So you'll be seeing them from now all the way till September, October. They eat anything in the legume family. So clover is great for them, bush clovers. Um, and they overwinter as a, a late larva. So that's why they were out early. Again, that's where they get their name, a small little tail. So this is a gray hair streak. It looks very similar to our Eastern tail blue. Um, this is a scrub hair streak. And the scrub hair streak, uh, it, it is the most widely spread one in North America. So it comes out the earliest. Um, it'll eat many, many different things, but again, seems to prefer 
similar plants to the eastern tail blue. And so here it is side by side for comparison. When you really look at it, they're very distinct. Their size is different, which is hard to tell here, but their tails are a very different size. And when you look at the antenna of the gray hair streak, it actually has some orange on the end. So again, the, there are so many things that if we take our time and we work together through these modules, we do a lot of training on individual butterflies, try to introduce 10 or 12 in depth, more conversation. And then um, we do a lot of back and forth quizzing. So hopefully by the end of a few months, you're feeling confident. Again, if you're out this week, you may capture a sight of some of the alphans that started early in the spring, brown alphans, eat blueberries, dry areas, pine alphans. And of special note, if you're very interested in butterflies and maybe you're already an aficionado and know a lot of your common ones, um, we are in a very unique window of time for some of our rare species. Uh, the frosted elfin butterfly that is state endangered and eats wild lupin lives here in the Concord Pine Barrens and their flight is about to end uh, over the next week. Um, but if you do have the opportunity to come out this weekend, you might have the chance to see them. And you're looking, the key characteristics to define them is be near lupin, which is flowering, um, but also um, look for this black dot. So very unique. And the corner blue is flying in the wild right now. Um, so it's a great time to come out. There is a second brood that'll fly later in the summer, uh, but may not be as easy to cue in on if the lupin's not in flower. Again, this is the lupin in flower. And we just ask if you do happen to come out to the Fish and Wildlife Service easement that you mind the trails and don't step on lupin because there's developing caterpillars and chrysalis and all different things occurring. Um, so we want to be mindful of that. So hopefully you're interested in working with us at some point. And here's a few ways that you can get started. Um, if you just are in your garden this weekend, you can provide an individual observation. Um, E-Butterfly or iNaturalist are great for collecting that data. Uh, I'm gonna go through a quick thing on iNaturalist before we go tonight. Um, but as I mentioned, we're really working to train people to maybe do more sophisticated surveys if possible as well. And that's these point counts that were started about 20 or 30 years ago. And they're very similar to the Christmas bird count um, in the fact that they standardize how data is collected to use it across multiple um, researchers, all kinds of um, questions, um, and, and it's really more powerful as well. Um, there's some future things that we may look into, and I just say stay tuned. So I know um, there's a BioBlitz coming up at Audubon at the McLean Center later this month, and I believe there's a training series that occurred or is occurring on how to use iNaturalist in preparation. But here's just a real quick 101 as well. Um, iNaturalist is where you submit any sort of observation. You can sign up online, get an account. Um, it doesn't just have to be butterflies, but of course that's what we're talking about tonight. Within that, we've created the New Hampshire Butterfly Monitoring Network Project. So what this means is that it created parameters so that any observation of a butterfly in the state of New Hampshire gets swept up into this project so that we can start to look for trends or answer interesting questions or just see what's out there. Uh, so this project was started uh, in about February of this year. 
Um, one thing that's cool is that you don't have to join it. You don't have to identify with it. But if you do happen to submit an observation, it'll be included if it meets criteria. So when I say observation, again, it's any individual butterfly that you see. So if you see a butterfly, um, you're going to record the date and the location, maybe take a photo of it, um, and you can upload it to the iNaturalist program. So let's walk through it. Here is a screenshot of the application on your phone. So if you were to upload the app, um, you would then use the observe button to begin a new observation. At that point, you have the opportunity to either take the picture right then, or if you've taken it earlier and you're doing this after the fact because you're so busy looking at things, um, you can go back to your photo library. So in this case, I'm going to take a photo. Then what it does is it allows you to offer a suggestion. I think that's a hair streak. I think that's a blue. Um, if you're a little more savvy, you might actually call out a species name and there's a drop down list. If you don't know, that's okay because once you submit it, other people are going to comment on what they think it is. So it's a really good tool to learn as well. In addition, if you're using your camera to take a photo, you're going to get a date and timestamp. So that fulfills that information requirement. And you may or may not have um, your location data available. That's a choice. Um, if you don't have your GPS linked or on at for this particular app, you can just hit the arrow button and it'll pull up a map. And so you can actually scroll and zoom into the map to show your location. So it's pretty simple. When you are looking through the data, you can look at specific species, you can see the dates that they would expect it to be out. What we can do here is see oh, wow, that's the earliest date that's ever been observed or recorded, or that's the latest date, getting into the multi-generations or extended time periods. Um, this can also help you identify like, oh, are other people seeing it right now? You can also look at a map. Uh, so here we see all the records of the eastern pine elfin, and it seems to indicate it only lives south of the White Mountains. Okay, maybe that's true. But if we're all working together, maybe it's just that someone hasn't recorded an observation up there. If you're up there and you record it, you, you may have just documented the most furthest north observation. You're you're feeding us in for like new data that really um, could lead to just better detail. The more individual observations, the more powerful this data becomes. So again, for it to be included, you have to know a date, you have to know a location and be able to map it or identify the lat long and to have a photo of it. So you could on your desktop at home, upload a camera photo and, and do all those other pieces. And if the photos of a certain quality and the AI recognizes it, it'll become research grade right away, or other people will be able to help you um, identify and get us to that um, good identification. So, in the future, again, our goal is to inspire people to do these point counts. And here's a snapshot of the point counts that exist in our region um, as of the end of 2021. There has only been one that's been going on in New Hampshire for about 19 years, and that's the Baker Pond point count. So there's a lot we can do 
to make this happen. And these point counts um, are originally designed to occur around 4th of July. So again, the almost the complete opposite of the Christmas bird count, but they take place in a 15 mile diameter circle. And basically you meet on a particular morning, all the people who want to participate, you break up into groups and you go out and observe two or three properties in each party and come back and compile the data. That's it. Again, what makes it so strong is that it's all done at the same day, in the same window of time, the weather's good, and everyone is recording the distance that they walk and the number of butterflies they see at that property and the time they started and the time they ended. That's it. So our goal with all of this promotion and joining with people and um, just starting to offer trainings, we want to have hundreds of people become aware of butterflies and be able to participate in these NAB accounts, but also, you know, again, iNaturalist observations, eButterfly. Um, our plan is to join with partners like New Hampshire Audubon to develop these circles um, and have them be like our anchor partner to help us have a meeting place, um, maybe host these trainings, have the butterfly club form. Uh, in some areas, again, we have two right now, um, they are doing field trips on their own. They're, they're meeting, they have the opportunity to continue to challenge each other. Um, our goal is to increase those iNaturalist observations and eButterfly by 20% in the next few years. So just a quick note, um, that snapshot of when the project was created, there were 6,000 and change uh, observations, 6,100. And that was 11 years of data. So on average, that's 500 observations a year. Already in the first two months of 2022, since we've begun our trainings, there's 400 observations. I think we're gonna blow through that annual amount and, and just really meet this goal. And in the future, we want to launch a, a monitoring network website that really allows people to connect um, with this type of group and people um, have different field trips, trainings and things um, up there, videos, whatever that it can grow to be, but really find a home to solidify this effort. So, Next year, uh, any time from fall or winter, dates yet to be determined, um, we will be launching three new butterfly clubs um, to offer trainings through. Uh, one hosted by our partners here in New Hampshire Audubon in the capital region. Uh, we're also looking to do one in the seacoast and also up north uh, out of Tin Mountain Conservation. Um, Ongoing, we have the uh, Lake Sunapee area and then also in the Southwest part, the Super Sanctuary. So those clubs met uh, one day a month, uh, one evening a month, sometimes Zoom, some were in person um, to go over butterflies. And over the course of four months, they learned about 50 butterfly species in depth. So really going to be ready to help with those point counts. Um, starting this year. So our goal is if you have interest to join one of these clubs and then join us out in the field um, to collect that data. And then we wanna offer opportunistic events of just general trainings um, to keep people interested. Don't forget though, beyond just the monitoring in the meanwhile, you can manage and steward your land as they've so greatly explained the pollinator gardens and the pollinator message with New Hampshire Audubon, plant natives, create that habitat, avoid your pesticides, herbicides and insecticides impacting their habitat or directly impacting them as individuals. 
mow in the fall or in the spring if you can. If not, maybe rotate your mowing to different times and only mow a portion of your habitat area in the summer to prevent impacts to species and the same species year after year. And I just want to thank uh, a few people who have really helped me um, launch this. Amy Highstrom, who donated a lot of her own photography um, to make some of the training modules that we are using. Mark Ellingwood, who helped pilot the use of them and really leading people um, to, to show us how we can improve over time. And then, of course, our anchor partners. Um, and I'm really hoping that you will join us and I'll see you out in the field. Thanks, Heidi. That was great. Um, Willow will probably come up again so that we have uh, a face of Audubon here. But there are a couple of questions just to start out. And um, also we share that if people wanna ask questions directly, that Willa can then um, open up your microphone so you can do that. So Deb asked, do you want historical observations? People have been uploading historical observations and I, I do, I think it's great. I, I think especially iNaturalist and all of that, let's get them somewhere, you know? It's the easiest place to put them. I don't have to manage a spreadsheet. Uh, I can download that. So if you have the ability, I, I'm definitely encouraging that. Great, thanks, Deb. Willa, did you wanna ask your question? Yes, please. Um, so my question was from earlier when we were talking, when you were talking about butterflies overwintering. And as a gardener, I've been trying to encourage all of my fellow gardeners to leave things alone for the purpose of the bees. I hadn't entirely thought about these butterflies and I was wondering, Heidi, if you can recommend some tips and tricks for helping for the, these little guys survive through whatever stage they're in over the winter. Is there something that we can be doing as gardeners, landscapers, homeowners, home renters, anyone with access to land? I'm sure it's the same message that you were sharing about bees and the fact that um, I think we brought it up with the asters and that particular species that overwinters at the base of its host plant under the leaf litter. Some may burrow, maybe that's okay, but the leaf litter is going to offer some protection, especially in a year that there's no snowpack, um, which often is the buffer. So I would, I would just say leave them messy if you can. I don't rake up any leaf material until I start seeing the first bumblebees of the year. I, I sort of wait until then. And then I'm assuming a lot of things are moving, either hatched or caterpillars are moving and more able to survive, get out of the way. First critter arrives. Um, someone just popped into the chat. A question, my second question. So, um, Diane, did you want to ask that one? I think she, Natalie, put it in sure. the chat. She's, she's um, Heidi. Natalie's wondering if you recommend a particular book to help ID butterflies. So, you know, it really comes down to what you like. Um, I had a favorite that I've used since I started called Butterflies Through Binoculars. And it's really good photos. And, and I like that because it's realistic looking, but it's older. It's, it's not being reprinted, but it, and it's very specific to the East. Um, the Kaufman Guide was one we chose. It's more traditional and using drawings, but it is more realistic versus like really stuffy old plate books. So they put them more in their environment. So that, that, that one's really good. And they tend to show both sides of the wing um, and it's only Eastern North America. And th the reason I say to limit maybe to a region book is when you pick up some that are all of North America, there's gonna be a blue butterfly that's very specific to California. That's just gonna confuse you. And it's just too many to choose from. So I think that's my take home is choose a regional one. I just popped um, that butterflies through binoculars by a good reason there. And that link shows folks where they can potentially purchase a copy. 
And that was, Natalie, that was my exact question. I'm, I'm a bird dork and I have 900 bird books, but I always have that one that I go to. And so it's nice to have something from an expert who can make a suggestion. So thank you, Heidi. Sure. Um, if no one else has a question, I had another kind of weird one um, pertaining to wintering butterflies because my brain is having a really hard time grasping that. I have a hard enough time understanding how something that weighs less than a paperclip can fly from New Hampshire to Mexico, never mind survive our winters. So you had mentioned, I think it was the cabbage moth or cabbage, I'm sorry, cabbage something, caterpillar. White? Moth. Yeah, thank you, cabbage white. <laughs> Who overwinters in its butterfly form? How? Some, some species <laughs> do. And I think of like a lot, so commas do, question marks, morning cloaks. There's a few other ones that they're sort of, they may or they may not. So they're gonna hide in crevices of things, right? They're gonna slip into a crack of a tree trunk or they're going to hide in some rocks, in your wood pile, anywhere. So they just, but the cool thing about insects, you know, they are temperature dependent, but they have this like super power of being able to freeze. Okay. Right? They can actually yeah. freeze and, but there's different methods. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're avoiding it. Sometimes in they, they do that by creating an antifreeze. So they mm -hmm. change their water to alcohol within their bodies, or they actually allow their bodies to freeze and they prepare them for it. So it doesn't burst the cells. And then they unthaw. like, it's, it's so unique. That, that's, Amazing. I was wondering if it was similar to frogs with the, the antifreeze, um, but it's just they're so they seem so delicate, and yet they can survive some of the harshest climates on the planet. I mean, up in White Mountains, are you kidding? This is just this is astounding. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I'm sitting here. I turn off my camera because sometimes I'm like this, and I think it's <laughs> worrisome. But I'm just my absolutely mind blown by some of these facts that are. Butterflies. I mean, who knew? <laughs> um, Ian, we've got another one in the Q and the A. If you want to ask Heidi that one, um, when should we look for the information on workshops for top twenty butterflies? And I was going to actually ask you some of those questions too. Can you share out like how people can find out more? So I'm hoping to eventually have a, a list set up on our website but we've lost our web developer here several times and so and also we're a little busy right now with some of our our really rare butterflies so please be patient with us we've developed the training um, but anytime that we're going to be hosting it it will be advertised on nature groupie um, we're just starting to engage with unh and how they can help us um, even get more people to train across the state. So stay tuned. I'm really hoping to get at least one of those, a pilot one launched this year, um, but really start looking for next year as well. So like, this is a multi-year vision that I hope as we put it on the ground, it'll, it'll start running into perpetuity. And Heidi, I'm assuming that when you're running a training, it will, the information will come out both through the organization that you're collaborating with and also through New Hampshire Fish and Game so that the trainings will be advertised in some way or shared out. Absolutely. You know, again, we do nature groupie a lot because it's so broad um, and, but absolutely, because we will be partnering with organizations on all kinds of things. And, and so it will come out through different, um, mediums as well so so yeah, and, um sorry Heidi go ahead oh no I was just going to say you know there's different ways we're looking to present the material so maybe it's the top 20 but then maybe next spring it's the first 20 that are going to come out or the last 20 of the season so that's where we're going is really how can you get this information in many different ways that might be of most value to you and how you learn. You know, the current modules are based on coloration of butterflies and maybe that's the easiest way for you to learn, so. 
Um, Heidi, just one more question around the bird uh, here. I'm a birder, so I'm thinking bird counts, but I'm likening the butterfly counts to the Christmas bird count. And just curious if you're trying to get all of your counts in the same weekend, in the same window of time, or if there's some flexibility in when the actual count takes place. It is flexible. So right now, the general, um, it's June or July. Isn't that crazy? So it okay. can be, you know, around 4th of July, give or take a few weeks. A lot of them are on the weekends. And so this year we're staggering some of the counts. So people who are experienced can come and help from all around the state because we know we're we're all just getting trained up and so we're trying to have um, well knowledge people join in small parties with those that are learning to help really bring it home so we've we've staggered them um, and then there's the opportunity to repeat those in spring or fall windows to get the full breadth of species as well great and just to give people an idea of what kind of time they might be spending on a count, like when it would start and end in any particular um, day or count window? Absolutely. So it's really up to those. Um, we just need to track the information. So the way we're helping to prepare it is, you know, I'm working within uh, an area and say it's with a land trust. And so we're targeting the properties that they've protected and then other high quality habitats, maybe other conservation partners who want data and we'll give suggestions to people where to go. We might say, here's the three good sites for you on this west side of the circle. And they may have the friend or a spouse that's participating, or maybe they'll just get in a car with someone that they've met that day to go out. And um, so we'll meet in the morning, maybe 930. The count can't start till 10. Um, you need a minimum of four observers or parties for an hour and a half. So we're hoping you're going to go again, maybe to two sites in an hour and a half. Um, but you can participate up to three o'clock. And then we just got to get all that information back to make it count. That sounds great. Um, I should just, I'll just share. Does anyone else have any other questions? Willa, do you see anything? I do. There's one more question coming in from Sandy, and she's asking um, Heidi if you have a preference between iNaturalist or eButterfly. So, the only reason I haven't done a lot of um, discussion about eButterfly yet is because I just heard from one of the creators they're about to launch a new updated version. Oh. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And there's value to both in the sense that eButterfly has power like eBird, and it's really looking for um, walks and you know what you observe. So it's almost like a pollard walk, which is um, a butterfly thing. But um, for now, uh, as we're just getting going, I'm just trying to make it simple. If you go out tomorrow and see one, take a shot with iNaturalist and, and we'll start promoting eButterfly a little bit further as we go once, once we become more familiar with the new version. But it has a lot of power. That's, that's what I know. Yeah. So interesting. That's cool. I'll just ask one more question about the training, Heidi, and that is that do you want people who are planning to try to participate in the butterfly butterfly counts to have had the training before they participate? Or can they join up with a, with someone who's more experienced and participate in that way? I think we'll know more as we proceed. You know, we're piloting and we definitely would want to be cautious of being too overwhelmed with teaching on the day when mm -hmm. our goal is having some familiarity uh, with the protocol and we know what we're trying to accomplish together. So what we're doing right now is we're actually hosting a preliminary training in the field 
um, before the count for people participating in the clubs to get it get them familiar with the protocol so again it's a, it's a bit of a slow rollout um, but I think anyone you know again if you join one of these clubs you'll start to see you know the method to our madness and and so that way when we get there at 10, 10 o'clock it's go time and we get the best data we can that day and um, and we just keep improving from there okay good that I mean that's great to know it's very helpful information so thank you um i don't want to miss anybody else's questions if there's anyone else who wants to raise their hand or put a question in i don't want to um step on them but i don't see any right now well if you see any let me know i do not see um, any it looks like we might be wrapping up but diane i was wondering if you had any um anything you wanted to add to help assist the butterflies, hint, hint, native plant sale coming up at McLean. Yeah, so I was just gonna, I was just gonna share a couple of things. First, I wanted to give a huge thank you to Heidi. Really appreciate you being here, Heidi. Um, it's such valuable information, and we're really excited to have the opportunity to collaborate on the workshops and the counts coming up in this next year or so at New Hampshire Audubon. But I, I'll just give a few. Um, shout out and also Willa, thank you so much. Huge shout out to you for participating and being co-host here on our pollinator webinars. A couple of things coming up, as Willa already mentioned. One is we're having a native plant sale at the McLean Center on June 12th from noon to four. Bagley Palm Perennials will be coming with um, many plants and including some garden kits, which include kits that are um, plants that are attractive to butterflies. And um, they will be doing in-person sale. This is the first time in three years that we've actually done in-person. So we're excited to have them at McLean and we invite anyone who's interested in um, participating in including native plants in your own landscapes um, to please come and um, visit our pollinator garden at the same time because it will be in the pollinator garden. Um, we also have two other webinars coming up and one is actually an iNaturalist training for the BioBlitz, which is going to take place in our pollinator habitat on June 25th. And the training will be done on June 16th, which is a Thursday night webinar. So it will be from seven to 8.15. Um, and Heidi will be at our BioBlitz, so we're really excited. So she'll be leading the field group that's going to be looking um, for butterflies. And we have a number of other <laughs> experts, uh, bees, plants. So um, we'd love you to join us for that as well. And then we have one more pollinator webinar this spring, which is going to be on native bees and given by Nick Dorian out of Tufts. Um, and so we're pretty excited about that as well. So join us on June 23rd. So I think I've shared things that are coming up in the near future. Um, and again, a huge thank you to Heidi and Will, I'll turn it over to you in case you have any final. I think you covered it all, Diane. And we are just so gracious for your, your time that you've taken out of what is clearly a very busy field season for you, Heidi. So. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing an immense amount of knowledge. I still have like a hundred questions, so probably gonna email you, um, but this was fascinating. It was really informational, but approachable. And I hope a lot of you guys are interested in participating and getting more involved with all of these different resources that are located in the chat and will also be available as a recording in just about five days. So Heidi, thank you, Diane, thank you. And most importantly, Thank all of you guys for coming out this evening and joining us for another incredible pollinator, pollinator webinar series. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Heidi, thanks again. We'll be in touch and uh, have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks, Willa. Good night, everyone. Good night.